Uh, welcome back again. So our next uh, speaker is Professor Michael Hopkins. I had the very good fortune of uh, meeting Michael when we both were graduate students in Oxford. And uh, I must say that uh, since those days, one could clearly see that he was absolutely outstanding. In fact, while we were all struggling to survive in our graduate studies, Michael was doing simultaneously two PhD at the same time. One in Oxford, where I was, and at the same time at Northwestern. And in the two places, he was working with the top algebraic topologists of the time, doing very, very, very good work. He got both of his degrees, if I'm not mistaken, in 1984. Then he has, uh, well, he has been professor of mathematics at Harvard since 2005, after spending 15 years at MIT, and a few years at Princeton. He gave an invited address at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Zurich in 1994, and he was a plenary speaker at the 2002 International Congress of Mathematicians. He has been awarded several prizes. And, uh, but I, I think I, I can say that perhaps, this is my interpretation, but perhaps his greatest award, I don't know, or a very large award is uh, having proved uh, recently in a joint work with Douglas Ravenel and uh, Michael Hill, a long, long standing problem in algebraic topology, a problem in which almost every algebraic topologist had a thought and had a priority of frustration, which was known the Kerber or Arf Kerber invariant. That uh, long standing, very deep, very interesting problem. It started with a, a, a well, arose from with a, a work by Kerber, and then in a later work uh, by, by classical work by Kerber and Milner about uh, groups of homotopy spheres. It was well that, that invariant that problem played a, a very very crucial role that was published in 1963, and since then it was open until a few years ago. I can say that, uh, we can say that Hopkins' work has indeed revolutionized the field of algebraic topology. He has pioneered applications of homotopy theory to a range of areas in mathematics, collaborating with geometers, number theorists, and mathematical physicists. It is a privilege to have Professor Hopkins with us today. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, uh, Pepe, for <laughs> that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, it's a, an honor to be here and get to help, help, help celebrate the 75th anniversary of the center. Um, for me, uh, I've made many trips to Mexico and have many friends here, but this is the first time I've been here when my friend Sam Gitler wasn't. Um, so Sam was a uh, very important uh, person in algebraic topology and in my life, and uh, you'll see some of his work explicitly and implicitly in the things I want to talk about. So, <clears throat> so this is a joint project with Aravind Azak and John uh, Fazel, and uh, it has to do with applying methods of homotopy theory to solve a problem in algebra. And, uh, I was really struck during Maury's talk when he was talking about um, how these problems in algebraic geometry over the complex numbers you can, um, if you're approaching it algebraically, you have available reducing mod p, finding integral models or in, that you can reduce mod p and letting Frobenius act. And if you're thinking about uh, complex analytic methods, you have semi-analytic semi sets and that these two really belong to their own domains and yet get brought to bear on the same problems. In a way, I, what I'm, my main theme is something very analogous. That there's a problem, this problem of classifying algebraic vector bundles that one can approach with complex analysis with algebraic geometry, and now also with the methods of homotopy theory, and they give really different looks on the same problem. So, um, just to 
recapitulate this a little bit. Um, one of the things when you learn about the development of algebraic topology and homotopy theory is that the subject kind of develops as more and more problems in, in geometry and other parts of mathematics uh, become seen as problems in homotopy theory. <clears throat> and these things, even though they have origins outside of the subject, they wind up getting solved within homotopy theory, that, and it has its own peculiar little tools and uh, constructions that you don't really see outside of the subject. I mean, think of these things as uh, analogous to reducing mod p and letting Frobenius act. Uh, one of them is homotopy groups, maps from a sphere to a space up to deformations. Those are are very important. They've appeared in several talks here. David Gabay mentioned homotopy groups in his talks. And, um, and yet, one only really knows how to work with them using kind of methods in homotopy theory. And homotopy groups are used in homotopy theory to manufacture spaces out of cells. And again, that's something peculiar to the subject. You, you, this, this notion that a space is decomposed into cells and that you understand a space by homotopy groups and attaching cells is also something very, uh, very much in homotopy theory. So here's a picture of a, a manifold, a torus, decomposed into cells um, in a way that, um, in this case, isn't particularly geometric. But there's many, many more things in homotopy theory like this. There are spaces like eilenberg maclean spaces, which have a unique homotopy group. Um, there's Posnikov towers, spectra, Steenrod algebra, there's brown gittler spectra, there's Sam's name again. And these are all objects that are used within homotopy theory that are very hard to see outside the subject, that are used and brought to bear on, on these problems that are discovered to be homotopy invariants. So, um, <laughs> So as I said, up until about the 1970s, there tended to be problems in, in, in geometry, sometimes algebra, that were, were seen to be, be homotopy invariant or seen to be problems of homotopy theory, meaning they were invariant of deformations. And in the 1970s, there were many, many models for doing homotopy theory, and Quillen and Dan Kahn and others introduced what we now call abstract homotopy theory, which gave a way of attempting to use the methods of homotopy theory on, in really different categories. And, uh, but that was in the 1970s, and that didn't really take off um, outside of the subject until around, the 2000, around 2000. And uh, today, many, many mathematical questions are seen as questions in homotopy theory, and often they're approached using abstract homotopy theory. So that's what I want to talk about today, and the question I want to talk about is um, which complex vector bundles on a space have algebraic structures? So I don't know, on a complex algebraic variety. <laughs> so this is a problem, um, I mean, th this is far from being solved, uh, and it's a problem of of, it's a very difficult problem, and it's quite an interesting problem. So it was investigated intensely in the 70s, um, both by algebraic geometers and by analysts. Uh, Griffiths uh, studied this problem uh, in connection with the Hodge conjecture. If you could show, so you know every rational cohomology class is a churn class of a vector bundle. If you knew that vector bundle had an algebraic structure, then you would have lifted that to uh, an algebraic cohomology class, and you'd solve the Hodge conjecture. So it, Griffiths was very much um, interested in this problem, and the methods Griffiths used were, were really located in complex analysis. So it suffices to consider this over smooth affine varieties, and by a theorem of Grauer, such uh, vector bundles have a unique holomorphic connection. And Griffiths tried to measure the obstructions to that having an algebraic structure in terms of the growth rate of the connection. So his obstruction was expressed in terms of Nevin-Lena theory or value distribution theory, and he, and he gave uh, some obstructions in terms of the growth rate of a connection. And so I'm going to talk about some obstructions that um, come from a very different uh, or a source 
um, and are in principle comparable to the Griffiths obstructions, but um, we don't know how to compare them yet. Um, this, pro this question was also investigated in algebraic geometry by many people um, in connection with, well, like, an, uh, in connection with, well, so, you know, the zero section of a line bundle is a co-dimension one subvariety by a, an, an analogous theorem of Sayre and Hartshorn. And in good cases, uh, co-dimension two subvarieties are all gotten by uh, zero sections of rank two vector bundles. And classifying vector bundles tells you a lot about the internal geometry of the variety. So there were many, many people um, interested in this question of classifying or the existence and classification of, of vector bundles in, um, in algebraic geometry. But where I really want to start um, is with the conjecture of Sayers or an observation of Sayer, because this is where it looks like the question of, of classification of algebraic vector bundles could, in the first place, be a problem in homotopy theory. So in Sayers' famous 1955 paper uh, on algebraic coherent sheaves, he, he um, identifies this correspondence between vector bundles on a variety or a space and uh, finitely generated projective modules over the ring of functions. And in Sayer's case, uh, X was, a, was an alge uh, algebraic variety or an affine algebraic variety even, and, and so that's just a, a ring, a nice ring, but it, X could be a topological space, that could be the ring of continuous functions, or it could be something much more elaborate. And he made this remark in that paper that um, when X is affine in R space, um, he didn't know if there were finitely generated projective modules which were not free. And so that corresponds to a theorem in topology that vector bundles are homotopy invariant. A vector bundle over um, a space across an interval is always pulled back from a vector bundle over one of the ends, and in particular, a vector bundle over affine end space has to be trivial. And Sayer just made this remark that um, he was clearly thinking about the analogy with algebraic topology, and he just made this remark uh, that he didn't know if there were non-trivial vector bundles in algebraic geometry. Well, um, so this was a remark which, of course, soon became known as Sayer's conjecture. Uh, even though he didn't state it as a conjecture or a problem. And it was solved also in the 1970s, almost simultaneously by Quillen and Suslin. And they showed that if you're over a field, then indeed every finitely generated projective module is free. So with this work, it began to look a lot like ordinary, the um, ordinary geometry. Algebraic geometry started to look like differential or, uh, or even just look like topology, that vector bundles over contractible spaces had to be trivial. Um, and so the next step was taken by Bass and Quillen, and, um, and they built on this idea that vector bundles over a space cross an interval are the same up to isomorphism as vector bundles over a space. This is the, this fundamental thing that bundles are homotopy invariant um, meant that bundle theory, the study of bundle theory was, uh, could be located in homotopy theory, and, um, and that's one of, the, one of the big sources of problems in um, geometry, uh, finding themselves located in algebraic topology. So they made, um, so they made the following uh, question, they raised the, they, they made the following conjecture that if X is a, a well, in their case, a smooth algebraic variety um, are algebraic vector bundles up to isomorphism, homotopy invariant. So you replace the space X by a smooth variety, and you should replace uh, the affine line, by, uh, the unit interval, by an affine line. Now, I'll give you some examples of this in a minute, but I want to say there is some, a lot of question about for which X one expects this to be true, and it's not true for uh, projective varieties, you need to assume X is affine. But I'll get into some simple examples of this in a minute. 
So they phrase this entirely in terms of algebra. And for the purposes of this talk, you don't really need to parse what I've written here, but I just wrote the analogous statement uh, so I could say something precise. Um, but this basically says that a vector bundle over something cross a line is pulled back uh, along the projection map from a vector bundle over the thing you started with. And the Bass-Quillen conjecture was proved by Lindell uh, building on Quillen and Suslin's methods in 1981, at least in the case when um, the ring A was a regular ring over a field. So it was the affine coordinate ring of a smooth variety over a field. And this, um, well, I think it's, uh, it's, this is a wonderful story, and uh, I recommend, if you want to learn more about it, uh, T.Y. Lamb's book called uh, uh, Sayre's Problem on Projective Modules. So the situation was really well summarized by Frank Adams in a math review he wrote of a couple papers, which I've listed below, and he basically said, I've kind of been stealing from him, uh, when I uh, started this talk, that he basically said, you know, well, you can read it up there, but there seemed to be a kind of program where one takes some idea from bundle theory, expresses it in terms of projective modules, and then tries to prove the analogous thing in algebra. And this had, um, this was, um, I mean, these, these results tended to be true, and it, it made one think that bundle theory really could be studied using homotopy theory in algebraic geometry, just like it is in um, the topo algebraic topology of spaces. So we arrive at this question, uh, can algebraic vector bundles be studied using homotopy theory? Now, this homotopy theory can't be the usual homotopy theory of spaces. We don't have a unit interval in algebraic geometry. We could try to imitate some of the methods, but it's it's a good idea to, um, to just take advantage of the existing groundwork and, and, um, and think of this first, uh, first just get organ let abstract homotopy theory get us organized in thinking about the problem. So I wanna take a few minutes and just say what abstract homotopy theory is. So this took many years to, um, to arrive at this definition. As I said, it was introduced in the 1970s, but it really, it wasn't until um, almost the 2000s that um, the, 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 the definition and the point of view was boiled down to what I'm about to tell you. So in, at, you're doing abstract homotopy theory whenever you have some category and some class of maps that you want to regard as equivalences. So for instance, we're looking at, we might be looking at algebraic varieties, and we might be, want maps of the form x cross an affine line to x to be equivalences. And so, um, or we want to study things that don't see the difference between x and x cross an affine line. So the abstract setup is you have a category and a collection of maps that you want to regard as equivalences and for traditional reasons, these maps are called weak equivalences. And what you're interested in studying are invariants of your objects or functors to another category that don't see the difference between weakly equivalent things, functors that take weak equivalences to isomorphisms. So for instance, uh, by Lindell's theorem, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. So. All right, so the other feature, so that's the basic setup, and the other feature of abstract homotopy theory is that there's a universal homotopy invariant functor, a functor from your category to something called the homotopy category, uh, which is universal for functors that don't see the difference between weak equivalents, that, 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 that don't see the difference between weakly equivalent objects. And um, so this is the general abstract setup. You're studying some categories, some weak equivalences, and you're trying to understand the structure of the homotopy category. And what you do in all of these situations is you, you disassemble the objects uh, in terms of um, simpler objects, which might be, uh, which might not have been the kind of objects you would have been considered before, and you can apply 
the methods of homotopy theory to understand things. Anyway, I'll get to some examples of that in a minute. Let me give you some examples of abstract homotopy theory. So the prototype, the first one is ordinary homotopy theory, where you have the category of topological spaces, and W is the class of homotopy equivalences, or maybe weak, weak homotopy equivalences, which are maps that are isomorphisms of homotopy groups. So that I'm gonna, that will come up, and I will indicate that with a top as a, as a uh, superscript, and that's just classical homotopy theory. And in that case, the homotopy category is the usual homotopy category. And um, rather than write this for the set of maps in the homotopy category, I'll use this symbol with square brackets. <coughs> Um, okay, so there's another one that's of use, use in algebraic geometry. So let's suppose we want to study invariance of varieties. That means to every variety I have maybe a set, a set of objects, and to every map I have a map of sets, or maybe these are simplicial sets, uh, some combinatorial object that, uh, that's recording a, a, a bunch of invariants and the relationships between them. So Formally, though this isn't necessary, if you don't know these words, it's not necessary for understanding the talk. We're looking at simplicial presheaves on smooth varieties. And um, so that, those invariants at that level of generality don't capture one important property of, of, uh, of algebraic geometry, which is that you can, you, you want to, well, here's a picture, you want to when you have something written as a, a union of two pieces, you want to say that the, the invariance you're studying over the whole space, x, uh, can be gotten from studying these invariants on the intersections subject to some, on the open sets, subject to some kind of compatibility on the intersections. And um, you can express that in this abstract homotopy relation. You want to say that the diagram that expresses a space as a union of open sets glued along intersections is a weak equivalence. And so uh, you can introduce that, and um, you get an abstract homotopy theory, uh, which I'm just going to call algebraic homotopy theory. So this was introduced in 1973 by Ken Brown and his thesis, and it's it's very useful for getting organized, but um, you know you can think of all the cohomology theories you can think of as representable by eilenberg maclean spaces. You can import a lot of structure from algebraic topology into algebraic geometry, but it's kind of a formal point of view, and it doesn't often doesn't really. Um, well, I'll show you an example in, in a little bit. It doesn't really uh, reveal structure that you weren't seeing from the point of view of classical algebraic geometry before that. But nevertheless, there is this algebraic homotopy theory where we can kind of locate a lot of classical algebraic geometry. And in particular, though, well, so then around 2001, um, Morel and Voivodsky uh, introduced motivic homotopy theory. So in motivic homotopy theory, you take um, the same collection of things we were looking at in, um, al in algebraic homotopy theory, but you force the affine line to be contractible. Okay, so in motivic homotopy theory, you're looking at varieties. You're saying that um, a, a variety is the union of its open sets glued along intersections, and I'm saying the affine line is contractible. And I can formulate that, I can articulate that in this context of abstract homotopy theory with, um, uh, with these kind of weak equivalences. All right, and in that case, uh, that's called motivic homotopy theory, and it had some spectacular applications in the study of algebraic K theory. Uh, Voivodsky used it to prove the Milner conjectures on quadratic forms, and uh, Morel's made spectacular applications to, um, to other invariants. Mm -hmm. So this is motivic homotopy theory. So uh, just if that seemed abstract, that's the end of that abstract part. <laughs> in, but in, in, when the day is done, we have three kinds of places we can do homotopy theory. There's the homotopy theory of topological spaces, 
On the right, there's motivic homotopy theory, and then there's purely algebraic homotopy theory. Um, okay. So there's a relations between them, which I'll just call realization functors. Uh, if I have an algebraic variety over the complex numbers, I can regard it up to uh, motivic homotopy equivalences, and I can regard it as, it, I can look at its underlying analytic space and locate that in uh, ordinary algebraic topologies. Okay, so I said what we really want to do is bundle theory as expressed by Adams and as foreshadowed by Sayre and um, Bass and Quillen, and we want to study bundle theory from uh, this point of view of homotopy theory. So, so bundles are, are classified by maps into a classifying space. Uh, the first example we all learn about is Milner's, exam Milner's construction, um, and this was modified a little bit after that by Graham Siegel, who gave a simplicial classifying space. So this is something, if G is an algebraic group, this is an object that makes sense as a simplicial presheaf, so in, in my sequence of of categories, this object makes sense all the way back in algebraic uh, homotopy theory. So in ordinary topology, when I take the, I mean, this is the classical theorem that the set of principled G bundles is the set of homotopy classes of maps into this classifying space. And if G, G is the general linear group of, the K by K general linear group of the complex numbers or the unitary group, then this is, this is the set of k-dimensional vector bundles over x up to isomorphism. So um, it's also true uh, back in algebraic homotopy theory that vector bundles up to isomorphism is given by homotopy classes of maps into this same classifying space. But this is not a very deep result. This is just a reformulation. If you unpack all the definitions, this is just reformulating the local description of vector bundles in terms of charts and transition functions. So we have a way of expressing algebraic vector bundles and, and topological vector bundles in terms of homotopy classes of maps, or in terms of maps in two different homotopy categories, and this makes it seem natural to look at the same set of maps in the motivic homotopy category. So right now, we don't know any uh, relation between, anything about this. Um, I'll call these motivic vector bundles, and the realization maps give me a map from the set of algebraic vector bundles to the set of motivic vector bundles, and then there's a forgetful map to topological vector bundles. So if I was interested in the problem that I mentioned before of taking a, a vector bundle I might, a complex vector bundle I might produce in algebraic topology and finding an algebraic structure on it, that problem would break and this breaks it into two. First I might try to find a motivic vector bundle and then I might try to give that motivic vector bundle an algebraic structure. Okay. so. So the first thing I want to point out is those, those, those uh, different kinds of vector bundles aren't that different. So there's an a fantastic theorem uh, originally due to Morel, um, and it was given a much simpler proof by Azak, Oiwa, and Vent um, just a couple years ago. And that says that if you have a smooth affine variety, this, uh, an there's no difference between algebraic and motivic vector bundles. So you can think of this as really the ultimate expression of what Sayre was hinting at in his question about um, the homotopy invariance of vector bundles. This says it exactly happens in algebraic geometry the way it happens in algebraic topology, that, um, that algebraic vector bundles is homotopy classes of maps into a classifying space, but, wh but by home, where by homotopy we really mean algebraic homotopy. So this is a, this paper of Azak Oiwa and Vent is really great. It, it's, it's almost a place you could start learning uh, motivic homotopy theory from. And it's a, it's a really, I, I highly recommend that paper if you're interested in this subject. 
Anyway, this I think of as really the ultimate expression of this, at least over fields, of this theorem, of this, of this arc that kind of began with this observation of Sayer. So that's true for affine varieties. What happens with projective varieties? Well, I've written down an example here, but, um, and I'll put it up in case you want to look at it. But maybe I'll just say uh, what this is. This is an example of a, of a, of a one-parameter algebraic family of vector bundles on the projective line which at, where the vector bundle at 0 and the vector bundle at 1 are not isomorphic. And if you want, it's just the um, extensions of O of 1 by O of minus 1 form a vector space, and I can draw a path from the, a non-trivial extension to the split extension, and those vector bundles wind up being non-isomorphic. So this simple example is just there to point out that you can't even expect vector bundles, vector bundles over projective varieties aren't homotopy invariant in the first place, and it's not so clear how one might even locate them in motivic homotopy theory. Okay, so uh, one naive question, uh, I believe the answer to this is wrong, is no, but I don't know, uh, I don't know for sure, uh, that one might express sort of the moduli space of motivic vector bundles on X in terms of algebraic vector bundles up to homotopy. It might be that the most naive thing happens, that you just, you just, I, you just take the quotient of all vector bundles by the equivalence relation of homotopy, and you get motivic vector bundles. So this, um, this is probably wrong, but I don't know. It's correct for P1. It's correct for... It's, it's correct for P1. Um, if you knew it for projective spaces in higher dimension and for K equals 2, uh, by the, some results I'm about to describe later, you'd have counterexamples to some famous uh, conjectures. So I don't, know, I don't know what's going on, what the relationship here is, but I think it's a really interesting question. So there is nevertheless something you can do. You can locate this construction of motivic vector bundles on projective varieties entirely in terms of algebraic geometry. And that's due to this really cool trick uh, due to Juanelu called Juanelu's device. So I think the coolest thing, the, way, the easiest way to explain it is to just take an example of something that's not an affine variety, which is if you take the affine uh, n, n, n space and remove the origin. So, if, if n is greater than 1, that takes more than one equation to define, and so the complement to the origin won't be an affine variety. Any function that vanishes, um, yeah, it, it won't be an affine variety. Okay, um, but you can make it an affine variety by giving the vectors x1 up to xn a reason, that vector, a reason for not being the zero vector. So instead of looking at um, vectors x, look at pairs of vectors x, y, so that x dot y equals 1. Now, <clears throat> the difference between any two y is a vector such that x dot y is equal to 0, and that, the solutions to that is a vector space. So this space of pairs like that, that maps to the affine n space minus the origin, and the fibers are affine spaces. The difference between any two of those is a point in a vector space. So that's an equivalence in this motivic world. So what I've done is shown you that I can find, even, even for this non-affine variety, affine n space minus the origin, I can find an affine variety that's homotopy equivalent to it in motivic homotopy theory. Now, that actually, you can just modify this a little bit and do this for any quasi-projective variety. So to any quasi-projective variety, you can find an affine variety that's homotopy equivalent. And this is called Joano's device. And, um, and uh, if the variety you started with is smooth, so is Joano's device. OK, so let me see. Uh, I gave another example. Uh, 
I wanted to give you the example for projective space, because that's going to play an important role later on. Um, and the simplest way to do it is to just make that ring I wrote down into a graded ring by giving x degree 1 and y degree negative 1 and looking at the degree 0 part. In geometric terms, what the Zhuanalu device for projective space is, is it's the space of rank 1 projective operators on n plus 1 space. So the, the, the line is the image of the projective op projection operator. That's an affine variety and it's a uh, homotopy equivalent to projective space. Anyway, this will play a role later on, so I wanted at some point to have explicitly mentioned the ring. <clears throat> so that lets us build this little di diagram. We have uh, motivic vector bundles on a smooth variety. Uh, because the Joanna device is homotopy equivalent, that's the same as motivic vector bundles on the Joanna device. And that, by the theorem of Morel and the Azak Oiwa invent, is the same as uh, algebraic, vector bun algebraic vector bundles on the Joanalu device. <clears throat> so the relationship between um, uh, motivic vector bundles and algebraic vector bundles on non affine things is also a problem purely in algebraic geometry. It's the problem of whether or not a vector bundle up on the Joanalu device is pulled back from a vector bundle on x. And that, um, that also seems to be a very hard problem. I don't know of any counterexamples to that. But again, if that was true in general, you would know um, counterexamples to famous conjectures. So, But nevertheless, so this theory of motivic vector bundles, it means something. It's not, it does sit in between topological and algebraic vector bundles, but um, and the relationship, so on affine things, that's, those are algebraic vector bundles, and on projective things, um, the, the relationship between them has to do with the difference between vector bundles on X and on the Joanalu device. Okay, so that's a long kind of wind up in, in setting the stage, and uh, now I want to actually talk about using the methods of homotopy theory to investigate these motivic vector bundles. And that gets formulated in any abstract homotopy theory in terms of obstruction theory. So in spaces, uh, we can study the maps from x to y in terms of, well, this is Steenrod's obstruction theory, in terms of the cohomology of x with coefficients in the homotopy groups of y. And one of the lessons that comes out of abstract homotopy theory is that this always holds. In every abstract homotopy theory, it has its own internal notion of homotopy groups and its own internal notion of cohomology, and there's always a relationship like these. Sometimes these homotopy groups and cohomology groups are inv invariants people studied but weren't aware were in this relationship, and sometimes they're completely new invariants. So, in, so let me just go through and tell you what this looks like uh, in the three categories we've been looking at. So in algebraic homotopy theory, the homotopy groups of this classifying space are just 0 when i is not 0, and the group you started with when i is equal to 1, and the obstruction theory doesn't do anything. It just, re it just recovers the, uh, um, the isomorphism of uh, rank k vector bundles or principal G bundles as H1. But as I told you, that category is very formal. You don't, you don't kind of penetrate into the structure of the objects in any significant way. In motivic homotopy theory, it's very different. The homotopy groups are now sheaves of a very special kind, but I don't want to get into that. Um, so pi zero is trivial. The fundamental group is the sheaf GL1. And the second one is what's called milner witt K theory, and it's related to the K theory uh, introduced by Milner in his paper on, um, <clears throat> on uh, algebraic K-theory and quadratic forms. So, so that, the appearance of this Milner-Witt K-theory in the homotopy groups of the classifying space for rank two vector bundles makes that, brings that invariant, it, 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 it lends it some significance in the classification of vector bundles. 
So what you're supposed to come a, away from this with is this idea that in motivic homotopy theory, the obstruction theory and the cohomology, um, they really do kind of penetrate and, and decompose the structure of the objects you're looking at in ways that are, are unfamiliar uh, if you're looking at it from the point of view of classical algebraic geometry. So this already has many applications. Uh, Morel and Azak and Fazal investigated problems like finding free summands of, of projective modules over regular rings, and they had a lot of success in, in low dimensions. Um, <clears throat> so there's a paper, right, so uh, Jean and Arvin and I got looking at this um, and thinking about this work of Griffiths from the 70s, and in the 70s, so there was this, I don't want to call it a belief. So Griffiths was working on these in order to solve the Hodge conjecture. So if you had a vector bundle, and the whole point was to, to, to realize cohomology classes as churn classes of algebraic vector bundles. So there was a philosophy that if the churn classes were algebraic, the vector bundle was. But I don't know how seriously anybody took that. It, it's a philosophy that's in, in the papers, but f for the problems of interest in that era, assuming the churn classes were algebraic was giving away the game anyway. Nevertheless, um, we got interested in, um, in answering that question. Suppose you have a complex affine variety and a complex vector bundle whose churn classes are algebraic, then is the vector bundle algebraic? And um, the answer is no. Uh, so you can use Steenrod operations, and though that kind of Steenrod operations relating things like Milnerwitt K groups and stuff like that, you can, you can use that apparatus to show that um, there's a smooth hypersurface of bi degree three, four with a rank two topological vector bundle on the complement, so that complement's an affine variety that has algebraic churn classes, but it's not algebraizable. So this was just something, um, I think this is just something that illustrates kind of the power of these techniques. And one thing I find really interesting, but we haven't had a chance to even start to explore it, is um, to try to understand the relationship. So this involves Steenrod operations in relating these kind of strange cohomology groups. In principle, there must be a Griffiths obstruction to algebraizing this vector bundle, which is something expressed in terms of uh, value distribution theory. And there must be a relationship between these Steenrod operations in Milner K theory and, and value distribution theory. But I have no idea how that, what that relationship is. Uh, but this is a project we're very interested in. In, uh, in approaching. So this, I think, is one place where you really do see a problem, uh, like Maury was talking about, where I looked at from one point of view, we can study uh, Steenrod operations and solve it, but it's also something that has an expression in terms of complex analysis, and, uh, uh, and trying to find the relationship between those is, is really fascinating. Okay, <clears throat> so, so that's one theorem using this, these abstract methods uh, that applies to vector bundles on affine varieties. Uh, what about vector bundles on projective space? So this is a very famous problem to classify rank two bundles on projective end space. This problem has a long history, and um, it gets expressed in a famous conjecture of Hartshorn that says, if n is greater than five, every rank two bundle is a sum of line bundles. So this has an interpretation in terms of co-dimension two subvarieties of projective n space. <clears throat> um, and so, so as I say, this problem has a long history. Um, there was a something I'll call the Grauer-Schneider problem. This was. Um, it was a theorem for a little while, and then a, an error was found in a proof. But, um, but the, what the assertion was that if n is greater than three, every unstable rank two vector bundle is a sum of line bundles. So unstable is in the sense of Mumford, but um, 
If the churn classes are zero, then the bundle's unstable. So in particular, uh, if you had a non-trivial, in particular, Hartshorn's conjecture implies that if you construct a vector bundle on, of rank two on Pn for n greater than five, um, with no churn classes, it better be trivial. And so the Grauer-Schneider problem is a special case of Hartshorn's conjecture. Um, but, um, well, let me just go on. So in the 70s, so Elm, there was a, when the Grauer-Schneider problem was a theorem, uh, there was a little bit of an, uh, a mission to search for topological vector bundles with vanishing churn classes. And as you can tell from the title of that paper, uh, Elmer Reese produced some bundles. And uh, he produced some infinitely many vector bundles on Pn uh, with no churn classes. And so if you knew this, that the Grauer-Schneider problem was true, this would imply these vectors have no algebraic structure. Uh, we don't know the Grauer-Schneider problem. And to this day, it's not, there's no known example of a topological vector bundle on projective space that doesn't have an algebraic structure. So I want to um, talk a little bit about these Reese bundles. And in fact, it was Elmer Reese that got me interested in this problem in the first place. <laughs> so here's, here's how the Reese, uh, this is a good illustration of how obstruction theory kind of takes apart a, a problem like this. And so the rank two bundles on projective end space is homotopy classes of maps into the classifying space of the group of two by two unitary or two by two invertible matrices. And if I wrote down the obstruction theory and topology that involves the cohomology of projective space with coefficients in the homotopy groups of this classifying space, and projective space has only even dimensional cohomology, so I've just written those as even. And so I'm interested in knowing about the even homotopy groups of this classifying space of U2. And those work out to be isomorphic to the odd homotopy groups of the three sphere. <clears throat> so if I understood something about the odd homotopy groups of the three sphere, I might be able to say something about topological vector bundles on projective space. Well, one does know something about the odd homotopy groups of the th three sphere. In the first place you have one, you have an element of order p in pi 4p minus 3. So what Reese did was he studied the vector, he, he studied vector bundles associated to that element. And um, in particular, he studied this one on complex projective space of dimension 2p minus 1 that's gotten uh, by that composite of maps that I've drawn there. And these bundles, because the classifying map factors through the quotient of that projective space by the one just lower, they don't have any churn classes. So he proved that um, these were non-trivial. They have no churn classes. And so by the standard philosophy, they're predicted not to have an algebraic structure. All right, well, at the beginning, as I, when I got done setting up all this abstract homotopy theory, I introduced these three categories. And um, it's believed that this bundle doesn't have an algebraic structure. Uh, does it have a motivic structure? Maybe we could use the Steenrod operations in Milner K groups and things like that in order to show that it didn't have a motivic structure, and then that would at least give an example of something that doesn't have an algebraic structure. Well, it turns out it does have an, a motivic structure, and I want to say a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and you can translate that into algebraic into a problem, in, into a, an assertion in algebra. So it says there's a module over that ring, J0, the degree 0 part of that ring I wrote down. There's a rank 2 module with the property that when you add a free module, a rank 2 projective module, so when you add a free module to it, it becomes free, but it's not free. And you know it's not free because when you realize it in topology, it corresponds to this interesting non-trivial vector bundle. So this is a rank two module. I have no idea how to construct, or how to write down using algebra. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of the construction of it to show you kind of what 
what it is that motivic homotopy theory can do that, uh, that you can't do or we don't know how to do just in terms of, of rings. But I just want to emphasize there's a ring. It's very easy to write down. We have a rank two. We have an interesting rank two projective module that we have no idea how to write down. So these, this element in pi four, this, these Reese bundles come from this element in pi 4p minus 3 of the 3 sphere. And the key step in, you need a good geometric or linear algebra construction of that map. And the key step is the existence is, a dia is this diagram. Now this map from GLNC to the 2n minus 1 sphere is just taking, say, the first standard basis vector, or just taking the first column, say, of a matrix, an n by n matrix, and looking at the unit and dividing it by its norm. Okay, so that's the quotient. If I had written un, that's the quotient of un by un minus 1. So that doesn't have a section, but if you compose it with the map of degree n minus 1 factorial, it does have a section. Now this is a, a well-known fact from K theory. This bun, this, this, uh, this is used to construct the generator of the K theory of S2n, and that n minus 1 factorial is a, is a, was a number produced by Bott, and it, it has to do with the top churn class of that bundle. <clears throat> okay, anyway, using that, you build a map from the 2p sphere to the 3 sphere, and you compose that map with its 2p minus 3-fold suspension to get this element in pi 4p minus 3 of S3. So in order to do this in motivic homotopy theory, we would need to do all of these steps. Now, um, now I was just talking about spheres, so I better talk about, tell you what the spheres are in motivic homotopy theory. And there's, instead of a, so they're like topological spheres, they have a dimension, but they also have a Hodge weight. There's two indices. So um, I've given you some examples here. The S11 is the affine line minus the origin. You're supposed to picture the complex numbers minus the origin, so that's a circle. Um, you could also take the affine line, think of it over the reals, and just glue 0 and 1 together. That gives you another sphere with Hodge weight 0. And using some standard methods, you can build other spheres out of those. So affine n space minus the origin is 2n minus 1 dimensional and has Hodge weight n. And projective n space mod the, oh, that's supposed to be a pn minus 1, has a dimension 2n and Hodge weight n. Um, I see that time is kind of getting away from me. So uh, sure, there's homotopy groups as well. And you can realize these to ordinary groups in topology. Anyway, the key thing <coughs> is to produce this key diagram, right? Given we're supposed to produce a map from that odd sphere to itself of degree n minus 1 factorial that factors through GLn. Now, <coughs> I wrote it this way, and I used the Juanalu device for affine n space minus the origin, because general principles tell you this, this diagram, if it exists in motivic homotopy theory, actually has to exist in algebra. And it has an algebraic interpretation. <clears throat> so this says, given two vectors, x and y, whose dot product is 1, that there's an n by n matrix, well, not with the first vector the naive thing would be there's an n by n matrix whose top row is that vector. That would be the same thing as having a section of that map. We don't expect that. We, in fact, we know there can't be one, uh, but we might hope for one of degree n minus 1 factorial, and that's saying, uh, well, I don't, I don't put the original vector in the top row, but I raise, it, I raise the entries to some powers whose product is divisible by n minus 1 factorial. And it's an amazing, it's a really, I don't know where this came from, but it's an amazing theorem, a whole theory of Suslin. This is Suslin's n factorial theorem, and it's, and it's part of his theory of unimodular rows that says 
exactly that you can do that, given two vectors whose dot product is one and some exponents whose product is divisible by n minus one factorial, you can find an, an, a unimodular and by a matrix whose top row is that. So Suslin's theorem, his theory of unimodular rows, gives you this key step. And everything else is formal. I want to put it up uh, because uh, there's this extra piece of information in motivic homotopy theory, which is the Hodge weight. When all this is done, you can imitate the exact same construction, and you produce this element in pi 4 p minus 3 of s3, but it has, and it has Hodge weight uh, 2p. But if you think about what we needed to make a vector bundle, so that was eventually supposed to be a map from a projective space mod a lower one, we were supposed to get um, something, a map from S 4p minus 3 to S3, where the Hodge weight was 2p minus 1. So the Hodge weight is wrong. And this seemed like an exciting thing at first, because it looked, I mean, what do you have in motivic homotopy theory that you don't have in ordinary homotopy theory is the Hodge structure. And it really felt like this was going to be a way of using that to obstruct this, the existence of this bundle. But in motivic homotopy theory, there's an operation on torsion elements that just that lowers the Hodge weight by one, and it realizes under topological realization to the identity. And you can apply that and lift the Riesz bundles to motivic vector bundles. <clears throat> so once you realize that you can kind of move the Hodge weight around, it gives you this sense that, that maybe motivic vector bundles over things like projective space aren't so different from topological vector bundles. And I'll come to that, and I'm going to finish on that in just a second. But let me just come back here. Um, we've shown that these Riesz bundles lift to motivic bundles. Um, and now we have explicit vector bundles over the Joanelu device for projective space. Either they're examples of things that don't descend, that those would be new examples, or they do descend, and they're counterexamples to the Hartshorn conjecture. So these are, these are fascinating objects, and, and, and I think there's, they're very concrete, and I think, you know, well, as I just said, I mean, one of two things is true about them, and they're both, either one would be interesting. Okay, I want to wrap this up in just a minute, and so um, I'm going to be a little bit brief about this last point. But um, as I said, this being able to move the Hodge weight around it makes it hard to think of ways that are things that are really going to stand between ordinary homotopy theory of things like projective spaces and motivic homotopy theory. And in ordinary homotopy theory, there's a really fantastic way of taking things apart into pieces involving something called complex cobordism. And, um, I just want to, um, and there's something that makes it very powerful, and it's, uh, I think this is one of the best kept secrets of algebraic topology. So in algebraic topology, there's this amazing class of spaces that have no odd homotopy groups and no odd cells. So uh, something like infinite dimensional complex projective space or the classifying space for the unitary group or the classifying space for K theory um, another example that's non-trivial is the universal, the classifying space for bundles whose second churn class is zero. That has only even homotopy groups and only even dimensional cells. So these spaces are called even, and Steve Wilson in his thesis showed that the classifying space of complex cobordism is even. Now I don't have time to go into why that's such a powerful thing, but it allows you to build really, to resolve spaces in unexpected ways in terms of Eilen McLean spaces. So, um, Azak and Jean Fazel and I, we, um, we just explored the analog of this in motivic homotopy theory. So there's an obvious analog of the definition of, of even motivic space, and, um, we 
we've been exploring something we call the Wilson space hypothesis, which is that the classifying space of algebraic cobordism is even. Um, so if you knew this, uh, let me just say, this allows you to make some really unexpected resolutions. And I put this in quotes because we haven't really worked out all the details, but it, things look pretty good. Um, it, it implies that if, if the Wilson space hypothesis holds, it implies that this, this little thing about moving the Hodge weight around was, was part of something much stronger. And it says that there's no difference between topological and motivic vector bundles on projective space or more, more generally anything with an algebraic cell decomposition. So this is a very interesting hypothesis. And um, oops, I wanted to go back and just ruminate on that for a second. Um, well, maybe I won't since time is short. I'll just, uh, let me just summarize here. Uh, so I started with this question about which complex vector bundles on which on complex algebraic varieties have algebraic structures. And uh, it doesn't seem to want to advance. And um, so here's the diagram that kind of summarizes what I've said. Uh, the Wilson space hypothesis would tell you you can, um, you know, for when they have algebraic cell decompositions, you can lift every topological vector bundle to a motivic bundle. Then this theorem of, of uh, Morel and uh, Azak, uh, Oiwa, and Vent would tell you that's the same as vector bundles over the Zhuanalu device. And, it, and the, so the Wilson space hypothesis, it locates the question of when a topological vector bundle has an algebraic structure on, on, on these kind of varieties, on projective space, entirely in algebraic geometry. It, it, and it's the question of descending vector bundles from the Zhuanalu device to the variety. Okay, anyway, I'll stop there. I look like I've gone over time, so thank you. <laughs> Preguntas o comentarios? Okay, what methods do you expect to the proof of the Wilson's uh, hypothesis? Well, <clears throat> so the, I think we need to build a, a model for that space. The method in homotopy theory is it's an elaborate calculation that just kind of produces, appears to produce the answer by accident. And I, what we're currently trying to do is take some constructions that give varieties with algebraic cell decompositions, like um, quiver varieties and things like that, and trying to use those to make a model for the classifying space for complex cobordism. So um, that result seems to be true in many, many, many categories. Uh, Mike Hill and I have shown it's true in um, certain kinds of equivariant homotopy theory. And, uh, but, but really, uh, we're looking for a reason that it's true. And uh, even in ordinary homotopy theory, finding a, writing that as some kind of co-limit of varieties with, uh, with cell decomposition, is, is, uh, that's what we're trying to do. So um, maybe I didn't catch it, but so what you're claiming is that the lifting of these Ruiz bundles, and you, you lift them to that, to that J, P, and then push them down to P, N, that will give you an example of a decomposable vector bundle for N. Yeah, it would give you a non-trivial vector bundle on P, N with no churn classes. So if it was decomposable, it would have to be trivial. Um, but, right. but yeah. I, that could be just as hard as the original problem, but I, but these, yeah, I, these bundles over the J are already new. So, okay. Yeah. So any? Yeah. No, it's good. So <clears throat> you mentioned that when you have. Uh, Back, uh, motivic back, mod, homotopy being, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. being the same as algebraic back. 
uh, this would give counterexamples to many conjectures. What would be the most typical conjecture that it would give a counterexample? Well, it would prove, mm -hmm. it would prove that uh, every vector bundle on the Joano device comes from one on the on the projective space. Uh, so, so it would give this. It would give that. Yeah, yeah. it would give Harshon, the surjectivity. And Metley Harshon's conjecture would be false then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I, I don't. I don't have an opinion about Hartshorn's conjecture. I just, uh, but yeah, that that naive guess would imply that. That's right. Uh, More questions? Okay, then let us uh, thank the speaker again.